Hey everybody, so today we are going to be going over the top four ways you can use your ontology or knowledge graph model if you are ready to start putting it into practice because I too struggled with this when I first got started. And honestly, it's not always very clear on what do you do with this model and how can you actually make it actionable once you're done with it. And by the way, there's no definition of done in this space because your business and your data is always going to be changing. So this is maybe probably your first draft. <laughs> All right, so kicking off, we're gonna go over three pre-flight steps. So the first thing is, which use case did you have in mind? And if you don't have a use case for your business in mind, take a step back and think about that first. So the reason you wanna do that is because models need to be able to address your business need. And so even though maybe something seems logical and, and accurate the way that you have it modeled, it might not actually be appropriate for the end use case that you have in mind. So make sure you really understand what your model is going to be used for after you are ready to put it into practice so that you know you don't have a bunch of work that you have to go back and redo. The next thing is to make sure along with that use case is what format or what kind of schema does that end use case need? So when you're using most modeling tools, they will allow you to export the model in a number of different formats. Some of the most popular are like a CSV, a JSON-LD, XML, Turtle, RDF, OWL, you know, those are the most common, I would say, um, but there's maybe other use cases that maybe require a more proprietary export, um, especially if you're using something internal and you maybe have an internal schema that this thing has to work with or internal systems that were homegrown. So just make sure that you have that in mind because you want to make sure whatever the export is, is going to match whatever the use case can take in. And the third pre-flight step is to make sure that you take a breath and you release the model into the wild. Now, what do I mean by that? I think a lot of folks that get into um, how to model things, you get really invested and you have to put a lot of uh, thought capital into the model that you're putting together. And sometimes a little piece of us gets put into that model, right? I have been there. I have shown a model to someone and said, look how beautiful it is. It just, it came together so well. There was very little like, you know, other category weirdness that I had to deal with. It was great. And then I found out it didn't work for anything that we were trying to do. And I had to completely refigure everything. So this was early in my career. And honestly, because I put so much of my heart and soul into it, it was really devastating. So my big piece of advice in going into this is make sure that you can um, release your baby out, right? Like let it grow into the thing that it needs to be instead of your baby that you keep and then it's only yours and nobody can use it. So this first one might be a little bit of a cheat because honestly, you're probably going to have to do this for the other three ways that you can use your model and that is tagging. So um, what your model can be used for, right? Your model is a, a framework to then put data into and often that data is instance data. So you can have a class of business and then a, a type of business could be retailer or if you're getting even more specific, you could say Nike. Nike is a type of, of, of business brand, if you will. It's also types of products. So this is where like the modeling piece comes into what you're doing. Now, the reason that you have tagging is a major part of all the other outputs of, of your model is because that data that populates the model has to be on content or on activity or, or something that connects to your business value. A model on its own is not useful. A model that has no data to populate it is not useful. A model that has data, but that data is not assigned to any real, either tangible or, or business value thing, whether it's a business transaction or a product or um, maybe a system, it's not useful. <laughs> so this is a really big ticket item here. Now you can use your ontology to populate you know, maybe the tags so that when you're looking at content, the content then can get tagged 
with the um, the tag that then goes into your model, right? So again, you would have business and then you would have Nike and then Nike would be assigned to either a document or potentially a business transaction if it's coming from Nike, that sort of thing. Now, how do you do that? So what you would be doing is um, if your ontology is a higher level where you just have business and then businesses have phone numbers, that sort of thing, um, you're not going to be able to tag with the ontology itself. But if you have more specific tags, again, like Nike, you can then train machine learning models to recognize either Nike as a keyword in text or in voice or in images, um, like the logo, for instance, uh, you could also train on the characteristics of Nike so that when a machine learning model is looking for the thing that is described as Nike, it can recognize it whether the uh, keyword is there or not. So tagging the content itself is not necessarily in uh, the modeling and graph space, although it sometimes can be. This is usually part of like a content management or data pipeline or data enrichment uh, side of the business. And there are tools on the market that you can use to auto tag uh, your content. There are a few in my honest review uh, series, but a few that I know out there like Pool Party does this. Um, I know that there's commercial tools that just do content tagging. Um, there's uh, quite a few like Comprehend from AWS. There's uh, quite a few out there. So I'll, I'll leave it at that. You want to find a tool that does content tagging or um, if you're looking at voice, it would be voice recognition or image tagging. Whatever your content source is, that is what needs to be able to tag the content as it comes in with the data tags that you then have in your model. So that's how you make that full spectrum of ETL data coming in, model is defining that data, and then the data is then becoming meaningful and actionable because it's on stuff that you actually want to do things with. So that whole side, it's it's quite um, a long pipeline, uh, depending on what your business is. And if you want another video on like all of those uh, tools that I would suggest, let me know. But those are the ways that you would put your model into place for this one. Now, if your ontology isn't storing the data on its own, you're going to need to create an ETL pipeline. And if you don't know what that means, um, I'll put some links down below on just like finding out generalities around an ETL pipeline. Also, I have a video up here kind of talking about the generalities of an ETL versus an ELT pipeline. Um, so that might help you out. But what you're basically doing is you're taking wherever the raw data is. So if your model is businesses, but then you have a list of businesses from either your relational database, or maybe you already have this as um, maybe a lookup table, something of that nature for your graph database, then you need to create the pipeline to take the data and then be able to populate the model appropriately with that data. So then your model is more complete because it now has not only the, the model itself, but also the data that it represents. Now, when you're working in relational database world, there are a number of traditional ETL pipelines um, that you can use. A lot of tools have ETL pipelines associated with them. So for instance, with graph databases, a lot of them have an ETL pipeline where you can model the data and then populate that model with your data. So GraphDB, I have a whole video on that here. If you want to go and check out how that works. I know Neo4j also has a really great pipeline, um, AragnoDB. There, there's a lot of them out there that come with an ETL pipeline. You can also use your own on the side, but basically you're taking the raw data and then populating your model with it so that it can become meaningful and defined for then later use cases. So that gets into our second way that you can use your model, which is taking the populated model and then using alternative ways to model that data for additional use cases, because now you have a structured data set and content that is then also structured from the organization that the model gives you. Now, the content itself could be unstructured, right? It could be, you know, text or, or images or something like that. But the data behind it, the metadata behind it is now structured because you have a model that is populated with the data from the first thing that we talked about, which is the tagging. So once you have this organized, you can then use 
the data to populate things like a online browse experience, right? So you can use Nike and Puma and whatever other tags that you have to create a taxonomy. That taxonomy does not even have to mimic the ontology because the ontology is a back end system kind of thing that doesn't necessarily have to be shown to customers. But it does help you define, is this Nike the company versus Nike the, the types of products that we have? And that might be helpful for you when you are then designing a browse experience versus maybe a company landing page. Because if you have a company landing page, there might be things from Nike that are not just shoes, right? But if in your uh, modeling, you have Nike products versus Nike the company, you cannot differentiate between the two when you are then setting up additional uses of, of this data, like a browse taxonomy or a company landing page. I would say this is one of the, the main uses of a model is defining and structuring your data, right? And so once you have your, your data structured, you can use it for a lot of different use cases. And it's, you know, the, the graph as, as a data source. And that is one of the top reasons that people have a graph. Most things that we have nowadays have some kind of graph behind them, whether you know it or not. And that's the key is you don't need to know there's a graph behind it anywhere because it's it's a secondary use case. It's just using the, the graph and, and your model that is backing that graph to to make more meaningful experiences for customers or for users or or for whoever you're doing this for. All right, so the tools for this are very similar to the ones that we described in the first way that you use your model with the tagging. But in this one, you would actually be partnering likely with the folks that are either designing the taxonomy or designing uh, the SharePoint site or um, those that are doing your um, data catalog, if that's what you're using this for, or the, um, the folks that are designing how the data then supplies your interfaces, right? So if those experiences are on a mobile app or on um, some kind of exchange uh, through social media or, um, if you're designing browsable things on a product website, there are folks that are going to be designing how that works. And so you want to work with them because they need to know how to get the data and they need to know how that data is defined so that they know when they are uh, coding everything that they are using the correct data that is then being supplied from your model and then the data and the content that it then is supporting. So you really need to have some partnerships in this one. So the next is, analyzing data. So the first, which is organizing, you obviously now, because it's a structured data source that has meaning to it, can analyze, you know, your product catalog or, you know, your customer interactions or how well you do personalization, that kind of thing. You can do analysts, analytics that way too. But a lot of other folks are now spinning up graphs in order to do like fraud detection or, you know, cybersecurity work or, you know, looking at uh, safety measures, how safe is something, how often does something break down, a lot of manufacturing, supply chain, um, that sort of thing, uses a graph to tag up things that are content, yes, but also systems and processes. And so if you can analyze the data, you can then get insights from it, like trends and folks that are trying to figure out like forecasting, um, this is very common, of course, in anything in the banking space or the uh, investment space. That kind of thing um, is very, very common when you are looking at structured data and trying to find really meaningful insights. Being able to see how a lot of different things that are very dispersed and disjointed interact with one another is something that Graph is very good at. So in order to use your model for this, you are going to want to uh, look at the analytics tools that you're going to be using. So whether those are internal tools or things like um, Tableau or um, like Graphelion, like there's there's some graph specific, um, and I don't call them out specifically because they're great at it, just because I know um, they're, they're very known for this. Siren is another one. Go look at my honest review series for a few others that are out there. But you can very uh, closely match the uh, ETL pipeline that you are putting together to populate your, your model 
and the analytics that are then going to be able to use it. There's a lot of ways that you can use graph analytics. So any tool that's going to use graph analytics or analytics in general should be able to use a structured data source like your model. All right, and the last but certainly not least, this one is near and dear to my heart. I will put a whole video up here on how I've used uh, my models for helping with search engine optimization. And this doesn't necessarily mean you have to have it in search engines. That could be um, a browse experience too. Traditionally, we talk about browse experiences as taxonomies, but now they are content feeds. You know, if you're on LinkedIn, there's a feed of things that are coming through and data is supplying. Now there's algorithms defining what to do with that data, right? That's why you want to partner with the folks who are designing those experiences, um, as we mentioned in number two in this list. But this is where you can really help get better discovery of content. And by the way, I am defining um, the browsable experience different from search uh, because search is usually, you don't know necessarily what you're looking for exactly, whereas browse experience is, I know I'm looking for Nike stuff, I just don't know exactly what you provide, or I know I'm looking for this, fraudulent behavior, but I don't know who is like falling into it. So that kind of stuff, right? Like that is why I, I separate this search engine optimization apart from number two and three in this list. But normally when you're putting this into some kind of search experience, um, it is helping you usually expand um, what the query is, helping parse the query. So for the first one, that would be like kitty, cat, and kitty cat, and gato all mean the same thing, and your model can then define them as the same thing so that when they are then parsed, and that's the other word, reason you can use your model, is your model defines the characteristics of certain things. So if you need to do disambiguation or you need to do um, entity parsing or uh, chunking of your search or doing search boosting, maybe in your company, um, in, in your business, companies are way more important. So anytime a company shows up in a query, you wanna you know, give that an extra boost because you know that's what your customers are coming to you for is co company data. So you wanna boost that more. Um, all of those kinds of things happen because you have structured data in a model and then you have your content then with those tags on it so that you can add additional meaning and enrichment to your search experience. And so this, of course, is, is my bread and butter. I do a lot of things with graph and search engines. So there are tons of other things that you can do with your model in the search space. So the way to put this one into practice is for, for this kind of experience, you wanna make sure that you're partnering with your, your search folks because they're going to know how their search engine is set up and how there's always some kind of expansion list or you know block list and other things that that are part of the search engine so you want to partner with the teams that are working on that so they can use your models to then expand the queries when they come in you can also do an embedded graph here as well so that you can really get that true expansion outside of just a lookup table which is a little bit more limiting in my opinion now in the other spaces that i mentioned like entity parsing um chunking and and um, maybe entity resolution kind of stuff, that is where you would wanna partner probably with the folks that are doing um, the machine learning models for uh, search, probably. <laughs> Again, it depends on your, your business and how things are set up, but those are the folks that you're gonna to wanna to partner with because they're going to use your model to either train their models off of so that they can do um, higher confidence work with their models, or um, your model could also be used as a uh, control set. So they know that this is how a cat is defined. They know the content that you have that should show up for a search on cats. And then when they run their model and they uh, run their A-B testing, they can then compare this should should show up or this shouldn't show up, what happened? So this actually helps them develop um, better confidence in their models as well because they have a uh, control set that is highly regarded and highly structured and uh, they know it adheres to the business's expectations. So these are two really highly valuable things that your model can also be used for. All right, so a lot of the things that we went over in this video, you, you can tell that there's a lot of partnerships 
oftentimes you can't go at this alone. I think the only space that I've seen in my experience where you can get a lot of it done um, on your own, meaning in your department, is uh, this modeling of content or business needs is often associated with um, the folks that are producing content as well. So it's like the content management space or like if you're in the finance space, it's you're you're in the finance department and you're modeling these things. So then finance stuff can be um, organized and tagged and that sort of thing. So that's the space that I think um, you probably have more autonomy to get it all done in your department versus um, the other aspects in two, three, and four, where you very often have to work with the other folks that are going to be, you know, looking at the data, using the data, um, and and using the content that it is then representing. All right, so I hope this has been helpful. I have gone over a few different um, types of tools for each. If you want a more detailed list of tools that I would suggest for doing some of these, please let me know down below. And if I've missed any ways that you use your models, I would love to hear about it. These are the top uh, ways that you can use your model, but I know there are a lot of other ones out there that I did not probably cover in this video, but I would love to hear your perspective on that. All right, so with that, I wanna thank you very much and I'll catch you next time.